Hi there, today we'll look at Reformer, the Efficient Transformer by Nikita Kitaev, Lukas Kaiser and Anselm Levskaya. This is a paper that tries to reduce the extreme resource requirements of the Transformer model. Now if you haven't seen the Transformer model before, that's this thing, I suggest you go watch for example, my video on it, Attention is All You Need, it's called, where the transformer is introduced. The most famous transformer is called BERT, B-E-R-T, and you can also look that up. I've made a video about this. Uh, so what's the issue here? If you remember transformers, they need a lot of memory. And why? That's because they compute in each layer, they compute these attention uh, things. Let's recap shortly. In a transformer, you propagate information layer by layer. So you have layer here with some signal, and then the next layer that you try to propagate the signal. Now, <clears throat> what you do, you assign you assign key queries to each of the next layer. So each of the next layer has queries and queries are just vectors. This is a vector, this is a vector, this is a vector and so on. So basically the next layer has the ability to ask, to ask the last layer what it wants. This is a kind of an intrinsic property of uh, attention and I, as I said, I explained this in detail in the video, attention is all you need. Basically these are what's called queries, Q. And then this layer is exposing what are called keys. And keys, again, are vectors. So vector, 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 and so on. So keys are vectors. And the way that the information is propagated to the next layer is um, whenever, whatever, we, we consider, for example, this node here, right? This node. Let's make that yellow. When we consider this node here, it is going to look in the last layer which, which keys match my key the most. And in this case, it would probably be this key and this key, right? They match the key the most. And here we look at the inner product, so the, the angle between the vectors. And then information is aggregated by simply... Um, having a weighted average of the values. So information is coming in here and here. Actually, information is coming into all the nodes, but since only these keys match, the information will be propagated like this to this unit. We could do this for another unit. For example, this unit right here. What's the value of this unit? Well, we have to look at the key here. Which key is it going to be matched to? it's probably going to be matched to this key right here and probably no other key really. Uh, maybe this key a little bit. So the information of that node in the next layer will be whatever's information is coming in here, routed there, and a little bit of this information. So this is kind of a, it's not a hard, it's, a, it's called soft attention. Uh, so there's a little bit of information going everywhere, but the majority of the information is coming from the nodes where the keys match. So these are queries, these are keys, and technically these things coming in here are called values, but Jim, imagine the values simply as the information to be propagated, and the queries and the keys are responsible for routing that information to the next layer. All of these things are learned, so the queries, the keys, and the values. Now, what's the problem? The problem is between the queries and the keys. As you can see, what you have to do is you have to match every single query with every single key in order to find out where information goes. So this becomes order of, whatever. if you have D keys and D queries, order of D squared operations that you have to do. And of course, D squares values that you have to compute. And since these are all vectors, of course, there is D will not only be the number of keys, but then again, this is multiplied. So there is an inner multiplication with the dimensionality, let's call that capital D, 
of the um, no sorry that's not an inner multiplication um, let's just remain at this so d squared inner products between vectors of capital D uh, dimensions so it's not an it's not an easy uh, thing for resources to do you need a lot of resources to hold this all of this in memory at the same time and to compute all of these things the reformer aims to solve this problem so this this giant space problem that the transformers have space memory also computational uh, problem to a lesser degree mostly it's a it's a memory issue all right so what is happening here and you see you you see here that this this product between two matrices clearly gives you this kind of squared um, squared thing so what's happening in the reformer to do this the trick is the trick is if we, if we go back to this uh, drawing the trick is to create what's called a hashing scheme or buckets um, in creating buckets what you want to do is you want to group similar things together so let's say we create four buckets bucket one bucket two bucket three bucket four right and each bucket we label and bucket one we label with the up direction this with the right direction with the down direction the left direction as vectors and now we simply put each of the things into the bucket where it belongs most so let's for example this vector here it goes here oh, sorry that is like n absolutely not the right place it goes uh, probably here right uh, this vector here probably this one goes here right and so on so you'll end up each of these assigning a bucket so this these these all go into into that bucket let's continue uh, actually let's uh, also put the the keys in the same buckets so also the keys this key here probably goes to this bucket um, this key here probably goes to this bucket uh, let's say this key here probably goes to the bucket over here you already see so before right before we cared about this particular query and this particular key we just looked and we said those two will probably route information to each other because they're similar and now you can see they both ended up in the same bucket so the idea is to create a scheme where you throw these things into buckets such that if two vectors are similar they will end up in the same bucket with high probability so you'll only have to really compare things within the same bucket and not across all of these uh, d squared elements and that's the idea and the technique here is called locality sensitive hashing so locality sensitive hashing and short this is called LSH the idea is the following if you have two vectors v1 and v2 and they have and you have a distance measure a distance measure D D is a distance what you want is if the distance between v, v1 and v2 is small ah, that, I'm getting confused with color, with small then you want this, them in the same bucket and if the distance is large then you want them in a different bucket different buckets uh, you know what I mean <laughs> with high probability so all of these things with you say you want them in the same bucket with probability P uh, 
with probability P with high probability P and here you want them in different buckets with high probability or you want them in the same bucket with low probability. That's an, an equivalent form of stating. This is all formalized and I can direct you to the Wikipedia page of that. It's pretty good. Um, gives a concise definition. Here you can see that and uh, it gives a number of examples. So one example I'd like to give here for locality sensitive hashing is of course the scheme of bucketing will all depend on what your distance measure is. If you consider the distance measure simply to be the jacquard distance. So let's say we have two vectors, 0, 1, 0, 1, and here we have um, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and here it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. All right, so maybe you can see the first two vectors here are much more close together than the, the, the last vector. Now, in terms of bit differences, right? One scheme to do locality sensitive hashing is to simply subsample bits. So um, in this case, um, this is a slightly constructed example, we will just subsample the first two bits and then construct the buckets according to these bit values. So if we, since we sample two bits, we have four buckets, right? So this here is zero, zero, here is zero, 1, here is 1, 0, and here is 1, 1. That's the concept of locality sensitive hashing. You have these buckets, right? And then you can say, all right, this vector has 1, 0, goes into this, this goes into this, and then that goes into, sorry, the 0, 1 bucket, right? And you end up with what you have. You have the two close vectors in the same bucket, and the two far apart vectors in that bucket. Of course, that doesn't always work. You know, you can be unlucky in subsampling, but that's kind of trade-off you'll have to, to go for, right? If things that are close together happen with, it's a low probability, but if they happen to end up in the different buckets, then basically you lose the fact that they are close to each other. And you know, that's the trade-off. Now, the kind of locality sensitive hashing they use in the reformer now is what are called random projections. So let's say you have a bunch of vectors, and that's really what we care about, right? You have a bunch of vectors, and um, what you want, you, you want the keys and, and queries. So you have a bunch of vectors like this, and you want to create buckets such that vectors that are close together will end up in the same bucket and vectors that are far apart you'll, will end up in the in different buckets. The way, a, a cool way to do is, and this is in the cosine distance, so we care about the angle between vectors, right? A cool way to do this is to use random plane projections. And this, the, the cool thing about it is, it works for the cosine distance and you can basically choose how many buckets you create, right? Let's say we want to create four buckets here again. What we need is two hyperplanes. And what we'll do is, so here is the origin, we'll simply create two hyperplanes through the origin at random. So I'm going to draw a random hyperplane here, like this, and then a second random hyperplane, uh, like this. All right. So you would agree those are pretty random hyperplanes as much as I uh, can be a random generator. And then we'll simply label, so this will label hyperplane one, this will label hyperplane two, right? And now we simply assign each vector uh, bits according to the, w in which, on which side of the hyperplane they lie. So let's call this here the plus side and this here the minus side or even yeah, let's call this the plus and the minus. And here also we call this the plus side and this the minus side. So this vector here is its signs are plus, plus, right? Because it's on the plus side of both of hyperplanes. This vector plus, plus. This one plus, plus. This one here is called, it's on the negative side of plane two, but on the positive side of plane one, so it's plus minus. This one here 
minus, 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 minus. And these are your buckets. So you would group these vectors together because they have, they have the same signs. You would group that vector. You would group these vectors together. The combination of this with the attention, since in attention, you've seen, attention uses a softmax. And the softmax is dominated usually by the largest elements. And since we compute inner products, it means that this softmax thing is dominated by the by vectors that have small inner products. So basically, you, you don't have to look at all of these d squared vectors if you can find the ones that are uh, have the closest distance. You can pretty much ignore the others. And LSH allows you to do this. So build buckets of vectors with the with similar uh, directions, then you only have to care about these vectors comparing them to each other. Uh, so that's not a lot of vectors generally. And that's how you save a lot of, of work. So you will only have to care about these three vectors if your key vector, for example, is right here. Uh, you'll only have to care about these things in the same bucket. And you can ignore all of that rest of the space. Of course, the more hyperplanes you have, the more buckets you'll have, the less vectors you'll have in the same bucket. That's the general idea. I find this explanation to be a bit easy. You can equivalently explain it by doing these kind of random rotations in this space. Uh, you can think about how that will end up actually being the exact same thing as what I just explained, but I just like that my explanation uh, better, I think. All right, so the way they use this, they have an illustration right here, is the following. So they have these keys, right? Sequence of queries and keys. So they, they do equivalent queries and keys, which is a thing you can do in transformers. Uh, don't worry too much about it, um, whether they're different or not. But then they do this LSH bucketing. And here, the color of the cell is just the bucket, the LSH bucket at which it will end up. Then they sort that, right? As you can see, and now they do an additional thing, which is called the chunk. The, as you can see, there are not the same amount of vectors in each bucket. And that is uh, sometimes a problem because even though you've, you've reduced the memory, uh, the memory is still, the memory requirements are still dominated by the largest bucket, right? By whatever bucket has the most number of vectors, that will pretty much be your memory requirement. Because now you, you don't you don't have to, if this is D, right? You have to compute all the D squared things anymore. But you'll only have to compute this quantity, let's call that um, B. So max, the maximum bucket size. Uh, but that could still be large, right? If you look at a distribution, it's probably going to be something like this, right? Where mo most buckets have a kind of a, a standard number of vectors, but some buckets will have a lot of vectors. And that's, um, sorry, some few buckets will have a lot of vectors and your memory requirement is still dominated by this. So they do an additional thing, which is called chunking, which means they actually take fixed size chunks here, fixed size. Here, they always take four. And they say, all right, these are our chunks. And we will only compute attention within the chunks, right? So it could be that they're, they're, there's the same bucket is actually split between chunks. And that's why they do an additional thing is that you can attend two things in a different chunk, right? Right here. All right. You can attend two things in your neighboring chunks. So you're restricted to either your own chunk or your neighboring chunk. Note that there aren't any um, any arrows going over here. Um, so you can you can attend. They have this diagram here. Which things you can attend to? You can attend to yourself or attend to your neighboring thing, but not to any other thing or the other way around, right? So that's basically the the concept of. Um,
saving memory. Now your memory requirements are, if we call this quantity now, we call the other one B, let's call this the chunk size C, right? Your memory requirements are pretty much C squared plus whatever this uh, unidirectional, so not, this, this isn't squared, plus probably O of C, something like this. Um, so you, you bring your memory requirements down quite a bit. Now that's the, the, the general idea here. The problem they face, again, is... Um, so they face another problem where they say, hold on, I can find it right here. They say, hold on, um, we, we do have actually another problem. And that is that these transformers have to back propagate. So you'll have to forward propagate these things. And now we've kind of solved this D square computation issue. But what you'll have to do is if you go from layer to layer, right? layer, 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 layer. What you have to do is, if you propagate information forward, you still have to back propagate. And in order to back propagate, usually, usually, you'll have to remember all of these activations, right? So these activations, these activations. In order to do back prop, it is often the case that you actually have to remember the activations because in each forward propagation, in each layer here, you might lose some information. Imagine you have a, you have two, a, a layer that maps these two dimensional vectors, both to, so here, actually let's make this blue, maps these three vectors to the following um, configuration. So a layer maps these vectors to this, this, and this. So it maps two things to one thing, which, which you know, can uh, be if you, in a, in a linear layer, it can decide to map it to a lower dimensional subspace. So it could actually try, decide to map it to, in fact, to points, right? This is also a possibility. It could do dimension reduction. So because all of this, in order to do backprop, you actually have to remember these things in order to do proper backprop. Uh, this is a problem again for the transformer because all, all these activations, even though we've gotten rid of the D-square computation, they will have to be remembered and that takes a lot of memory. The way to solve this is actually to do invertible uh, layers. What that means is that if I propagate information forward, 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 I can figure out what the information here was simply by uh, looking at the backpropped activations. And this is this happens if the layer is invertible. So if this function here is invertible. So this, if F here technically is invertible. So I can actually write down the inverse of F and that is, is defined. Um, this of course is a pretty big restriction and the way they achieve it, I would like to Go to the blog here. Um, the way they achieve it is they do what's called uh, an idea from reversible networks, where they always have two sets of activations. That's what you see here, X1 and X2. And in each layer, only one of them is updated in a residual fashion. So you can see here layer one updates X2, but X1 remains uh, the same and goes to y1 right and then in the next layer layer 2 only updates um y uh, y1 in order to construct z1 but y2 remains the same to be z2 and then you can revert the layers you can basically figure out what the activations were from the uh back signal now that's extremely uh good if you want to save memory, but of course it restricts clearly. You have to be restricted to this kind of architecture or similar. This idea actually isn't new. Um, this has been used many times in things like normalizing flows, and I want to highlight this paper. 
I actually want to highlight specific. I chose this paper because uh, they have these nice diagrams where they show exactly this. Um, you see they have two sets, x1 and x2, that in forward propagation, they only update one of them. And then in backward, in what's called inverse propagation, they can figure out what those were. And they couple these in exactly the same way. Like here, this drawing might be even more uh, similar, where they alternate between updating the two activations. So you can think of this as a way to simply um, make the function that you're representing with the neural network invertible. That is a giant constraint on your architecture, but these methods here, these normalizing flow methods, use that so they can actually define an invertible uh, layer because they need the Jacobian inverse in order to compute their normalizing flow. Uh, so you see, that's why they originally did it. And I'm sure that that's not a, like a new idea or it's particularly new again. Um, Strangely, I haven't found the, the, any of the flows literature cited. They do cite the reversible residual net paper uh, that they probably got the idea from. All right, so with these two things, now you can save the giant computation, right? And you can also not store the forward activations. So they say they can take now, giant, giant, um, giant input sizes. You may remember transformers like BERT. So BERT, it can use something like 512 tokens in, in its input sequence. That means uh, the sequence that you can look at with BERT at a time is 512 long and not a bit longer, right? There have been some extensions to that. Um, for example, I believe in XLNet. So XLNet has pushed this to something like uh, C times 512, where C is a smallish constant um, that, that where you can kind of carry over information between sequences. But this thing here, as you can see, they calculate it could take up something like 64,000 tokens, and it, that would use in total 16 gigabytes of memory, which is available on a high-end GPU. Right? So this is a giant, um, this is a giant step forward in, in producing transformers that can actually take large models. And here you see the memory and time complexity. You can look at these things uh, yourself, but be, you can see maybe here that these squares here in the, from the original transformer, they now vanish from this. And all of these constants are, or a lot of these constants are actually smaller. For example, the chunk size is in there instead of kind of the entire sequence length. So. That's basically the, the paper. They show that they can actually uh, input those long sequences. They can apply this to images. You see there's ImageNet um, pixel by pixel, which is a lot of pixels and would have been absolutely unthinkable with one of the original transformers. And with that, I invite you to check out uh, the paper and the blog post, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.